How to be trustworthy. Some people start with zero trust in strangers and keep their guards high until they see enough signs that they feel comfortable letting their guard down. For these people, trust is slowly earned and a privilege never given. Trust is the ultimate placing of faith in someone, and that's not something to be taken lightly. On the other hand, other people immediately embrace strangers with open arms and assume good intentions. This is where trust is automatically given as a policy, with the understanding that it can be lost. Wherever you might fall on that spectrum, it's clear that trust is assigned different values based on people's experiences. If you've had positive experiences with being open with strangers, you're more likely to continue in that fashion and vice versa. This is all to say that trust can be a hard quality to nail down, perhaps harder than other facets of likability and charm. But is there a way to shortcut the process if you come across someone who thinks trust is to be earned over a long period of time? How can you win over even the most guarded and standoffish person who doesn't even leave their bag with you when they use the restroom. Well, on the topic of direct trust alone, there's a multitude of studies about what compels that feeling. A 2018 study called Stimulus Generalization as a Mechanism for Learning to Trust by Oriel Feldman Hall found that the trust we feel toward others depends on if the person resembles a past individual that was either trustworthy or untrustworthy. This would imply that trust functions more like what made Pavlov's dogs salivate, a knee-jerk reaction based on a simple association. For a more conventional perspective, a 1985 publication called Trust in Close Relationships by Rempel, Holmes, and Zana found that trust requires reliability, predictability, and thinking that the other person is concerned with your feelings. However, one of the first landmark studies on trust provides a more interesting and perhaps indirect insight into what creates trust, and it's one that we can harness for likability as well. More is better. Bestinger, Schachter, and Back studied the concept of trust in 1950 in Social Pressures in Informal Groups, a study of human factors in housing. They studied people who lived in an apartment building and the patterns of the friendships that formed. They found that neighbors who were on the same floor tended to be friends, people who lived on different floors were rarely friends, and people who lived near the mailboxes and staircases were friends with people on different floors. What can we conclude from this? To a large extent, friendship and trust increases linearly with simple interaction and exposure. The more we see someone, the more likely we will become friends with them and come to trust them. It didn't matter if there was any depth or rapport, the amount of interaction was the only factor that appeared to matter in the study. This was dubbed the propinquity effect. On a practical level, the more we see people, the more we interact with them, the more similarities we find, the more comfort we build, and the more we find that we can potentially like them. People cease to be whatever stereotype you have in mind, and they turn into unique, two-dimensional humans. This is something we'll cover in greater detail in a later chapter on how to avoid negative judgments. Prolonged exposure by itself will embed people into your mind as essentially part of the background. This is why when we change schools, jobs, or homes, we miss our neighbors or coworkers, even if we rarely spoke to them. There's been so much exposure and interaction that we tend to view them in a positive light and associate them with the environment as a whole. The level of interaction itself isn't important. The frequency of the interaction is. The propinquity effect is why it's not surprising that we are frequently friends with roommates, neighbors, co-workers, and classmates. You have a high level of exposure and interaction, you let your guard down around them, and you create an open mind toward friendship. If you look at your set of close friends, you would realize that a lot of those friends became friends of yours almost accidentally. They just frequently showed up in your life. They were at the right place at the right time, and they did the same things you did. You struck up a conversation, and then you kept seeing each other on a regular basis. It turns out that half of the battle in likability is showing up and not hiding in your room like a cat. The more you show your pretty face, 
the more trust will ultimately be built. For those you are specifically targeting to make friends and build trust with, make sure to frequently bump into them. The interaction itself can be minimal, as long as they take notice of your presence and acknowledge you. The goal is to become a known and familiar quantity in their lives. This manifests in even tiny ways in our daily life. The more you see a certain barista at a cafe you frequent, the more you feel like you know and trust them. The more you see a neighbor, even if it's just while you're both taking out your trash, the more you feel like you understand who they are and trust them. Repetition creates trust. A stark illustration of the importance of frequency of exposure is in sales. This is known sometimes as the sales or marketing rule of seven, which states that a customer needs to see a product or hear the product's pitch at least seven times in order to be ready to purchase. Another advertising guide written by Thomas Smith in 1885 espouses the need for 20 separate touch points before a purchase is made. In addition, salespeople are taught that the sale is always made in the follow-up and not the initial contact, and the propinquity effect is part of the reason why. So they will email, call, text, and make sure that you have so many points of contact with them that they are always in your ear. And oddly enough, this makes you trust them more because of the frequency and duration of their presence. If nothing has gone wrong, or terribly, then they are slowly proving themselves to be trustworthy, right? If you're trying to get people to like you and become their friend, the same process applies. Obviously, adopt a subtler method, but it's undeniable how salespeople are able to gain our trust through repeated exposure and interaction. The propinquity effect is highly related to the mere exposure effect, which similarly states the more we see something, the more we like it because we prefer familiarity. In 1968, in Attitudinal Effects of Mere Exposure, researcher Robert Zajonk showed participants Chinese characters, some characters only once, and some up to 25 times. He asked them to guess the meaning of each character, and the more times a participant had been exposed to the Chinese character, the more positive of a meaning they assigned to it. These various effects demonstrate that things tend to grow on us, and sometimes our tastes arise out of exposure and familiarity, not free will or actual affection. Familiarity is the ultimate precursor to trust. Credibility Credibility can be seen as a higher degree of trust. If you trust someone, you believe them but may not be sure about their sense of judgment. You feel comfortable that they care about you, however, if you believe someone has credibility, you may not necessarily trust them, but you view their judgment as rock solid. You believe what they say, though you might feel differently about their character. It might be a personal preference as to which of the two is more important, but it'd be even better to be able to create the feeling of both. Scientifically speaking, there is a wealth of subtle signs that can either bolster someone's credibility or tank it. If you've had any media training, or simply watched a politician interact with the media, you'll know that credibility doesn't just happen by accident. There are specific behaviors that make us want to believe them. They signal that this person is dependable, isn't a threat, and should in fact be followed. It's a finely tuned science that can make or break people. As recently as 1999, Gas and Cider in their book Persuasion, Social Influence, and Compliance Gaining sought to study credibility. They discovered a host of subtle indicators of credibility, as well as a host of signs that undermined credibility. Here are the signs that need to be in play for people to think you're credible. Highlight your experience and your qualifications. People are looking for an indication that you know what you're talking about. At the very least, they want to see facts that would support a conclusion that whatever judgments or decisions you make are based on something real. This is important for most people because if you've already seen something in the past or have been educated about it, chances are you know the right things to do. You would have the right information so the right decisions are made. People want proven quantities and not just people making educated guesses. Display how much you care. If it's obvious you care about other people and have their best interests at heart, 
they are more likely to trust you. You simply wouldn't act in any other way except to help them. However, if people can sense that you're looking to get a sale or line your own pockets, they're less likely to trust you. There's a conflict of interest here. They might feel that you're just too busy trying to benefit yourself instead of actually looking out for them. Don't show any ulterior motives and let people know you're on their side. Similarity You already know this. When people see that you're similar to them in terms of dress, body language, speaking style, and mother tongue, they're more likely to view you as credible. People tend to like other people who are like them. This is especially true if it appears that you share the same values as the people you're trying to impress. They'll believe you because people automatically trust those similar to them, such as their family. Appear assertive. If you are very assertive regarding your positions and you quickly and rationally destroy counterarguments, this makes you look like an expert. This is passion and conviction and confidence. This means that you know what you're talking about, or at least you look like you do. Chances are people can trust your judgments because you know the other side of the argument and can convincingly make those arguments go away. In other words, the more decisively you act, the more credible you appear. Gain social proof. When other credible people recommend you, chances are people will be less suspicious of you. If people they know and trust as experts recommend you, then you're essentially riding on the coattails of those people. You don't have to convince people because people they trust already open the doors for you. This is an extremely important competitive advantage. Unfortunately, not everybody can tap into this. This is what's behind every warm introduction. People will take a chance on you because someone vouched for you, and that's a powerful statement. Likewise, there are certain signals you can send out that can erode your credibility. Don't contradict yourself. If you're caught telling a lie or an obvious exaggeration, this can vaporize whatever credibility you've built up. If you're unsure about a certain assertion, follow this simple rule. When in doubt, leave it out. People may ask questions, and in many cases, you may not have answers to those questions. Instead of trying to look like a hero and guessing at an answer, you'd be better off telling people you don't know, or you'll get back to them. Recognize that you don't need an answer for everything, and if you appear infallible, it can look suspicious or manipulative. If you don't appear stupid, you might appear to be lying. Avoid being overly polite. This might come as a surprise to some. By being excessively polite and brown-nosing, you can come off as weak and tentative, which means that your opinions will also be taken as such. You look like you're simply looking for approval and telling people what they want to hear. You also appear to be insincere and manipulative, even if you're being sincere and honest. Too much politeness can often belie a lack of conviction or stance. You have to remember that people are looking for others whom they can listen to and follow. If you're busy walking on eggshells around them, you're sending the wrong signals. For many, the initial reaction to these credibility factors will be that they apply to an office environment. For instance, you might pay special attention to them during a job interview and not apply them in social situations. It may seem that way, but appearing credible to friends, the feeling that they rely on you and believe in your judgment, is just as important socially. It just shifts you into a person that others will listen to instead of ignore. And of course, Credibility and trust work hand in hand to increase your likability. Hello listeners, this is Russell with Newton Media Group, and I want to thank you for the time you've spent listening to the Social Skills Coaching Podcast. It's been a pleasure presenting Patrick King's material, and I hope you found it useful. I want to let you know that we're producing another podcast for you to check out, The Art and Science of Self-Growth, written by Peter Hollins and produced by Newton Media Group. We'll have some bonus material in the next few episodes from that new podcast, and hope you'll find it informative and helpful. Check out the show notes for the Anchor.fm link, or search your podcast provider for The Art and Science of Self-Growth by Peter Hollins. Before we get to that bonus audio, 
let me ask you a question. How often do you experience low energy or fatigue, erectile dysfunction, low sex drive, anxiety, brain fog, or even just have a hard time making decisions? These are all symptoms of a hormonal imbalance. And here's a stat for you. One in four men over 30 have hormonal imbalances and are low in testosterone. This condition is often misdiagnosed. I'd like to introduce you to our sponsor, Let's Get Checked, a company with the mission to make professional health testing easily accessible. Their fast, affordable, and confidential at-home male hormone test kits help you take a measured approach to your health and measure your hormone levels from the comfort of your home. Even better, Let's Get Checked customers can get 20% off by using this URL, trylgc.com slash nmg that's n as in newton m as in media g as in group it's really easy here's how it works go to trylgc.com slash nmg choose your test online and it'll be delivered to you in discreet packaging with next day delivery activate your test online and collect your sample one morning return the sample using the prepaid shipping label provided once your sample arrives in the lab, results will be available from your online account within two to five days. You'll get results on five hormonal levels, testosterone, sex hormone binding globulin, prolactin, estrogen, and your free androgen index, all without ever having to go to a doctor's office or a laboratory. I recently experienced my own kind of brain fog and low energy. I was very interested in my hormone levels and I I can't think of a better way than was offered with Let's Get Checked. Everything needed was in the kit with step-by-step -step instructions. It only took 10 or 15 minutes for the whole process. This testing isn't just for men who think they're in a funk. All men should be testing their hormone levels on a regular basis. Let's Get Checked Labs are CLIA approved and all data is completely anonymized. Get 20% off at trylgc.com nmg. That's T-R-Y-L-G-C dot com slash N-M-G. N as in Newton, M as in media, G as in group. Now, back to the episode and that bonus material from the new podcast, The Art and Science of Self-Growth by Peter Hollins. Physical Energy Vampires In a world where so much is abstract and verbal, it's easy to forget we don't actually live in our heads. And at the end of the day, our quality of life is directly related to how healthy we are physically. An energy vampire is what it sounds like, something that sucks us dry of our life force physically and leaves us tired and weak. Just like the energy pyramid mentioned in the previous chapter, this is the baseline of what's needed to set yourself up for success. We're all imbued with some energy on a daily basis, but even the most vigorous person doesn't have an infinite supply. To make it worse, there are aspects of everyday life that will gladly sap energy from us if we're not careful, leaving us unable to spend that energy on the things we truly value. Energy vampires are like leeches or parasites, and sometimes we can be living with them for so long, we don't even realize they're there, quietly draining us of our life and enthusiasm. We might not even realize we're in a passive negative state because of these vampires, but we nevertheless are trapped in that vicious cycle. You might be aware of many of these vampires in your own life right now and might be making active efforts to moderate their influence on you. But there are still other imperceptible forces that could act like invisible, underground leaks in your psyche. Imagine a woman who's been working in a job she actively hates for years. Picture how she has to force herself, day in and day out, to sit at her desk, to answer calls, to go to meetings, all the while despising the work but feeling powerless to do much about it. At the same time, she's in a relationship that just isn't working for her. This partner is inattentive, doesn't pull their weight, and leaves the woman feeling like she spends all her mental energy justifying to herself just exactly why she hasn't mustered up the guts to leave. It might sound silly, but such a woman could, after months and months, 
sit down on her sofa one evening and feel an overwhelming urge to cry. She could wonder if she is depressed or, worse, conclude that life is always this unpleasant and hopeless. But all that's happened is she's lost awareness of just how thoroughly depleted she is energy-wise. If she hasn't slept well for weeks, is eating junk food more often than not, and just came down with a slight cold, this feeling is going to be even worse. It's no use formulating this crisis as a relationship or career problem, although it may well be. In the bigger picture, before anything useful can happen, the woman needs to bring her big fat energy zero into the positive again. We talked about the energy pyramid earlier on and determined the four main elements of energy. In this chapter, let's focus on the purely physical aspect, since in many ways this is the most fundamental. Having your energy at zero, i.e. being fatigued, is the worst you can feel while still appearing relatively normal to others. Fatigue is not simply being sleepy because you had a poor rest the night before. Neither is it the feeling you get from being sore or tired after a hard workout at the gym. Importantly, fatigue can be felt in slightly different ways for different people. Some may feel extra heavy, as though they were walking around with a 300-pound bodysuit on. Others might feel slowed down or like they're in a fog and everything is getting blurry and washed out. Deep fatigue is like an extra bad hangover or feeling jet-lagged after a round-the-world flight. It can also feel like those tender, painful sensations you get all over your body as a flu is coming over you. Your entire system just feels weaker, slower, and more overwhelmed. When you're fatigued and your energy is low, everything feels harder than it normally does. You no longer have the patience, the acuity, the enthusiasm, or the tolerance to deal with basically anything that comes your way. If you've been fatigued for a very long time, you may find yourself feeling as though you're crawling through molasses, unable to complete even the most basic of physical tasks without extreme effort. Many people limp along in this condition for truly alarming periods of time, propped up by caffeine and medication to get them through the days long after their bodies have more or less given up. The end result is that your life is being interfered with and you're physically unable to do what you want or intend. Physical energy vampires are obvious and pretty common sense to identify. If you're starving and so sleepy you're nodding off at noon, it's clear you need to take better care of your diet and sleep schedule. With most physical energy vampires, the problem is not a lack of awareness, but merely a question of improving and changing habits. For most of us, it's easy enough to know that we're tired and run down. To get rid of physical energy vampires, we need to make sure we're setting up healthy habits, a concept that's simple, but perhaps not so easy to put into practice. Pushing too hard and not listening to your body's limits can lead to your body politely or not so politely reminding you to take a break. We all live busy lives and many of us carry on as though our energy, resources and time are infinite. But if your natural limits are not respected, sooner or later, you will have to pay. Fatigue and tiredness that are ignored for long enough could eventually lead to full-blown burnout, i.e. the gas tank is completely empty and even the reserve fuel is burnt up and gone. The body is, in the end, in charge. When it's had enough, it's had enough, and at some point, it will do what it needs to for self-protection. It's important to recognize the early signs of serious fatigue before it turns into burnout. What starts out as a physical phenomenon can, in time, bleed over into every area of your life, making us emotionally, cognitively, and socially exhausted, too. Whether you're a high achiever or simply pushed too far by external circumstances, look out for the following signs of burnout. First of all, be aware that burnout doesn't happen all at once, but insidiously creeping up on you. Chronic stress and lack of self-care can ratchet up until you're no longer able to function normally. But your body will give plenty of warning signs before this happens. You may feel tired for most of the day, most days, you may even dread the thought of having to do things while feeling so drained. You could suffer from insomnia or disturbed sleep and have difficulty concentrating 
or else feel quite forgetful. Physically, you may feel dizzy or get headaches, feel short of breath, or even experience chest pains, palpitations, and stomach trouble. In general, your body feels weaker somehow, and you may be more prone to illness and infection. Your appetite may vanish. Some people may experience a dull sense of being on edge all the time or worrying endlessly. Physical symptoms seem to translate emotionally into feelings of hopelessness, guilt, worthlessness, or just sadness. This depression could also manifest as anger or being irritated with others, snapping at others, or losing your temper. You may not really notice it at first, but you stop deriving joy from things that used to make you happy. Find yourself feeling avoidant and pessimistic? It could be the early warning signs of burnout. You may notice your inner self-talk get quite negative and judgmental, perhaps leading you to want to withdraw from friends and family, not quite having the energy to bother with socializing. Eventually, you may start feeling quite detached from the world as a whole, almost like a zombie disconnected from others and from life itself. You might want to physically remove yourself from work or family obligations, avoiding all interactions with others. Apathy, irritability, and the massive lurching feeling of what's the point are all signs of burnout. Now, simply saying rest as the solution to fatigue and exhaustion sounds pretty obvious. Yet, many people are unaware of how they're actively failing to maintain their own self-care and undermining their physical energy and well-being every day. The fact remains that the single biggest energy vampire is disturbed, poor quality sleep, or simply not enough sleep of any kind. This seems like an easy solution until you realize that great sleep hygiene is usually a skill to develop and a habit that needs constant, conscious attention to maintain. It's like a gym schedule or a healthy diet. It doesn't just happen on its own. This has been Endless Energy, a blueprint for productivity, focus, and self-discipline for the perpetually tired and lazy. Written by Peter Hollins, narrated by Russell Newton. Copyright 2019 by Peter Hollins. Production copyright by Peter Hollins.